Feral TV, the voice for humanity. Hi, welcome to the New York Parrot Literary Corner. I'm Dustin Pickering, and this is the best and only show giving a platform globally to writers and creative minds. Today we have Kathy Giorgio, who is the author of five novels, two short story collections, an essay collection, and two poetry chat books. A full length poetry collection, no matter which way you look, there is more to see, was just released in September, 2020. Her new novel, All Told, will be released in late 2021 by Austin McCauley Publishers. A poetry chat book, Olivia and 575, Autism and Haiku, will be released in early 2022 by Finishing Line Press. She's been nominated for the Pushcart Prize in Fiction and Poetry and awarded the Outstanding Achievement Award from the Wisconsin Library Association, Silver Pen Award for Literary Excellence, the Pencraft Award for Literary Excellence, and the Eric Hoffer Award in Fiction. She is the director and founder of the International Creative Writing Studio, All Writers Workplace and Workshop, LLC. Thanks for joining us today, Kathy. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So um, first question is, uh, what are your daily writing habits like? Do you have a specific schedule or a, uh, for your, uh, you know, like word count or how, how do you find time to write in, in, in this, in the, doing all your other activities? <laughs> it's a challenge uh, because with, with my business, with all writers, I teach approximately 85 hours a week and I have for 16 years since I started the studio but I'm, I'm pretty rigid with my schedule. I meet with clients in the morning. I write in the afternoon mm -hmm. for three to four hours. And then I teach and meet with clients in the evening. And I, I try to keep my afternoons absolutely sacred so that I, I have that time to write. It's still interrupted. I do teach a class Wednesday afternoon. So Wednesdays I don't write. And on Thursdays, if I've had anything rejected during the week, that's when I do my marketing. Excellent. So you're pretty, you're pretty disciplined in your, in your, uh, in general, just in, and you know, you, you set, you set your time together to, uh, for specific tasks. So you're, you're very, you know, block minded, I guess you could say, like, you just have this specific time that you sit down to write and, and that's mm -hmm. pretty much daily. Pretty much daily. I mean, I, I, and I have to be, you know, it's the only way I can get everything done. So and so you, I mean, obviously, I think novels would take a lot more discipline and, and uh, steadfast work than, than a poet. Poems can sometimes just be kind of, you know, easily done in a few minutes, and then you go back and revise and, you know, things like that. It's, and so I would say novels are probably a lot more, you know, time consuming and, and uh, it takes a lot more strength, I guess, you know, a lot of times to, or discipline to, to really get a novel knocked out. You know, right. how, how long does it take you to roughly to write your novels? The novels typically two to three years. Wow. So, and that's that includes revisions and, and writing of the of the book and everything. Right. Wow. Right. So it's it's a big time commitment. And when I first got started writing, I never would have thought I would be a novelist. Mm -hmm. I love the short story. If if someone came down and told me I could only write one genre for the rest of my life, it would be the short story. Mm -hmm. And even my novels, except for two of my novels, don't include short stories, but the other three do. Um, they have alternating chapters with short stories. Right. So you also have the um, spontaneous essays that you do. So how did that come about and what kind of topics do you typically write about in those essays? Okay. Well, that is, you You asked me before the program about the painting in back of me. That is the mm -hmm. cover of the book of the essays, which is called Today's Moment of Happiness Despite the News. And that came about totally by amazing error, really. Mm -hmm. um, two, two days after the inauguration in 2016, I was walking my dogs around the block. I live in a city. And a man was approaching us and I always try to get my dogs off the sidewalk for people who don't like dogs. 
and I apparently didn't get them off fast enough. And this man came up to us and had his, his leg drawn back. He was going to kick one of my dogs. So I put myself in between the dog and him and he kicked me instead. Uh, and he was wearing a Make America Great Again hat. He mm. grabbed me by the shoulders. He threw me off the sidewalk. He shook his finger in my face and he said, it's time for you to go back in your place now, woman. And then he mm. wandered off. Ouch. So yeah, I, I got home. I became one of the hate crimes that occurred after President Trump was elected. I ended up on national news. And the scary part actually wasn't the attack, but it was the aftermath. Um, I had hate emails coming to me, hate tweets, hate messages on Facebook, threats on my life, threats on my family's life, who said I was totally making it all up just to make President Trump look bad. And probably the scariest one was a note that was put right into my mailbox outside my house that said, we know where your daughter goes to school. Mm. And so it was a terrifying time. I became scared to leave home. I never knew what was going to happen once I set foot outside the door. And I knew I had to pull myself together because this is what I do. You know, I go out and I speak with people and I do readings and I do presentations and I teach. I couldn't be stuck at home. Wow. And so I told myself I would write one moment a day that made me happy. And I knew I couldn't do it privately because that would last maybe two days and I'd quit. So I put them up on Facebook and my Facebook page flooded with people trying to find out what made me happy. So I moved it to my website and it became a blog, Today's mm -hmm. Moment of Happiness Despite the News. And my website crashed three, four times because of traffic. And so I decided, okay, this is, this is something I'm going to do. And I committed to do it every day for a year. Mm -hmm. I didn't know when I committed that that was also going to be a year that my husband would lose his job twice, taking our health insurance with him. Mm -hmm. My daughter, who is high-functioning autistic, would be bullied so badly in school, we'd have to find another school for her. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Wow. So it was one hell of a year. Yeah, that sounds, <laughs> wow, that's way too much at one time. <laughs> right. But well, I, kept, uh, I kept doing it. I wrote one moment of happiness a day. There was only one day I didn't make it. And that was the day that my husband lost his second job. And by that point, I was in breast cancer. And we really, really needed health insurance. Mm -hmm. So I did it. We got to the end of the year. And I thought, oh, thank goodness. Because trying to find something every day, I will never write a blog every day again, because that was, that was, whoa, a lot of work. So I finished and I announced that I would make the blog into a weekly blog, this week's moment of happiness, despite the news. Mm -hmm. And everyone said, but it's going to be a book, right? And I was like, no, I, I, they're raw. I wrote them in 15 minutes. Other than looking at spelling and punctuation, I didn't rewrite them, no. Mm -hmm. But then my publisher contacted me and said, Kathy, they're asking for a book. Don't you think we should do a book? So oh. And that's how that book came about. That, that is a fascinating story. I mean, I guess, you know, sometimes tragedy can, can bring some wildflowers with it, you know? I mean, did that ever become a source of income to compensate? I mean, or did that just, you know, I mean, it sounds like a lot of people took a strong interest in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, hopefully that helped quite a bit with, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, a, it's just tough sometimes, it's, especially, you know, now we don't have much of a healthcare system left, you know, it seems like right. it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's in tatters. I mean, our, our country is just falling apart and then, I mean, it's coming worldwide now. It's like everybody's going nuts for some reason. I don't know what's going on. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that is a, quite a story. That's a tremendous strength on your part to uh continue writing in spite of all of the obstacles facing and you know that's that's a good inspirational story for people um so i was also going to ask um about that you know how, how long you said it took about 15 minutes and you didn't really edit or revise other than just you know punctuation spelling basic stuff but right. when it went to when it went to the market quote unquote the market um did, did you guys did you guys go through and maybe add or take out or do any real revisions nope. 
It went up as is. Yep. Wow. Interesting. Which Um, was really hard for me to do. You know, I mean, I, I polish everything before it goes out, but I knew mm -hmm. that the way people reacted to it, largely it was the rawness of it. You know, this wasn't me, the writer talking, this was just me talking. And very personal so, essays then yeah yeah and i think sometimes people like that side of people you know the writer you know the more the more personal side rather than the public literary persona mm-hmm. you know so what are some some teachers that you've had in the past um that you've worked with that have influenced you in your career teachers or other writers both really both. i mean uh, people teachers in the sort of abstract sense i guess you could say Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, my, I, immediately when you said teachers, my head goes to my high school creative writing teacher who I am still in touch with today. Oh. And he, he was one that I, I still have a story that he handed back to me. He wrote in red marker, which is one reason why when I teach, I write in purple marker because red after a while <laughs> made me cringe. But mm-hmm. he wrote me this long note about how I had a gift, which was wonderful but it came with a responsibility and the responsibility was to use it and to make sure that I was out there always writing, always pushing, always trying to get it out despite however many rejections I was going to get. Mm -hmm. And I hung on to that. And that's, that's something I have held on to throughout my life. I'm going to be 61 next month. And so he influenced me when I was 17. So he has been around a long time and keeps me going. Uh, Writers, John Irving, definitely, and and I've been compared to him. John Irving isn't afraid to write about quirky people, and and I love writing about quirky people. They're people that that you think that you maybe know, but have have a few differences maybe. Um, so John Irving, Ellen Gilchrist uh, is a Southern female writer who wasn't afraid to write about risky topics despite being in the south and Mm -hmm. so she she inspired me a lot to to just whatever i saw as important to write about put it down and start working on it so those two are probably my primary influences excellent so what about your uh, finishing line press titles i mean what what are what topics are you you know dealing with and and uh how how was the creative process for those my, my first book was called The Home for Wayward Clocks. And mm-hmm. it, it's, again, a book that the odd-numbered chapters are the novel and the even-numbered chapters are short stories. And it's basically the story of an older man who runs a clock museum in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, and is, is very attached to his clocks. You know, he, he feels his clocks are alive. He, he thinks the pendulums are the heartbeat. And... You know, so he's very attached to them. And then the clock, the chapters are the clock stories, how they came to be in the museum. As you read the book, you find out that how he became this way was his mother treated him like a dog from the day he was born. He was kept down in the root cellar. He was kept in a crate. Um, Back at that time, you would put a ticking alarm clock in with a baby puppy because it mimicked the mom's heartbeat. So he first bonded with an alarm clock. And so it it follows his abuse through his childhood and then shows how he is affected as an adult. And I wanted to show in that book, we've read so much in the news about people who are abused, about kids who are abused, found locked in closets, found locked in cages, and we never hear what happens to them. And, And I wanted to show that you can overcome. Mm-hmm. You know, you can become a whole member of society. You can be out there doing what you need to do. So that that one, I mean, the the severity of the abuse got me the label of a disturbing writer, of a dark writer. I don't consider myself to be that mm-hmm. way because it's redemptive. You know, he comes out the other side. So I hit abuse quite a bit. Uh, Rise from the river was a novel that, I mean, that one was very hard to write. It covers the the first trimester of a pregnancy that was the result of a rape. And 
the main character is a single mother. So I, I really put her in a tough spot. She'd had an abortion when she was in high school. So she knew what that was like when she got pregnant in college, she had the child. And so she knows what motherhood is like. She knows what it is to love a child, but she also knows how hard single parenthood is. And now she's raped and pregnant by a man from a different race. So all of this is hitting. Um, and I wanted with that one in particular, her rapist is found. And one of the things that many people don't know about is that if a woman is raped and becomes pregnant and her rapist is found in 39 states in the United States, she cannot give that child up for adoption without his releasing parental rights. He can ask for updates on her pregnancy from prison his family can ask for visitation rights and they will get them. Once he's out of prison, he can ask for visitation rights. He will likely get it. And so she, and she, if she keeps the child, she has to face all of that too, you know, that, mm -hmm. that she would still have this connection right at the moment in those 39 states. The only way a woman can absolutely make sure she has no contact with the rapist again is to abort the child. And so rather than talking about is abortion right or wrong, it's like, why don't we get rid of the rights that a rapist has over a child he mm -hmm. created and let the woman have more of a choice? Yeah, so so that that was, <laughs> was a hard book for me to write. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it was well accepted, but it was also coming out at the same time as Fifty Shades of Grey. And so that was very hard on me personally to see people flocking to read a book like Fifty Shades and not paying attention to, to my book. And so that, that was hard. The creative process, you know, is, is just, for me, it's totally getting into the character. You know, even if I am writing in the third person, I essentially become my main character and and try to get into her head or her heart i do tons of research to make sure i'm getting the emotions right and getting the situation right mm -hmm. and so it, it for the two years it took me to write that book it was a dark two years because i was really delving into some really hard things right there's like a lot of really tough realities out there and that's that's one of the many and considering now what we're facing with uh, a lot of these insane, you know, laws being passed uh, related to abortion or being pushed, you know, right. it's, it's very important that we recognize things like this. That's, you know, that this is an issue. I mean, you wouldn't even think in the United States of America we're supposed to be very progressive-minded, you know, and this kind of stuff. It's like it's absurd. It's obscene, you know. Uh, right. Definitely need to focus more on the real, the real, you know, issues rather than and trying to control women you know it's like what about the other side of this mm -hmm. right glad you you know you you wrote that and brought that to light and, and unfortunately as you said you know 50 shades of gray you know must have pushed it aside a little bit and yeah that is, that is tough some people like i guess don't like facing difficult realities they would either just you know frivolous stuff or something a little more you know i don't know unrealistic or weird or whatever i don't know what it is with people sometimes you never know they're unpredictable mm -hmm. but uh and you know i noticed that in a couple of your, your novel titles are you know and you mentioned one of them earlier you seem kind of preoccupied with time uh if um <laughs> where, where, where does that stem from or is that just sort of coincidental or maybe is that maybe it was like a novel series that, that came out and i i just noticed that those clocks and time and stuff in a lot of your books uh it's interesting right well of course the home for wayward clocks is about time and clocks there was a sequel called learning to tell a lifetime with a life in parentheses so it was learning to tell time mm -hmm. and then i edited a, a collection um called it's about time my my publisher asked me if i would do an anthology and so i i edited that i do collect clocks Mm -hmm. um, clocks. In fact, you can see behind me, there's several clocks oh, yes. just on my shelves. So, and, and in my living room and kitchen alone, there's over 60 clocks. 
So I'm I'm wow. very attached to clocks. I I <laughs> love going to flea markets and antique malls and and trying to find them. To me, it's it's amazing the history that they must have seen. You know, especially mm -hmm. the ones that are from the 1800s. They have seen mm -hmm. so much. So yeah, there's there's a lot about clocks in my early books in particular. So okay, interesting. So if you'd like to share a poem or two with us, if you would like to do that, there's time for that. Sure, I could do that. I can do it. I'll do it from the book that was released in September. You know, matter which way you look, there is more to see. This is my daughter on the cover, by the way. Oh wow! Um, this. It, she was she was dancing with the ocean <laughs> and i took that picture it was her first time meeting the pacific ocean oh cool very nice got a first time moment there yes well and and the new book that's coming out next august called olivia in 575 is also about her and she will be on the cover of that as well wonderful all right well, i'll do the opening poem because it's it's probably my favorite of the poems that I've written and definitely the poems that are in this book. It's called Phosphines and it is a prose poem. So you can see it's one great big square instead wow. of being broken up in stanzas. Okay, sounds good. Phosphines, noun, the colors are the stars you see when you close your eyes. Close, squeeze, the yellow of summer after summer, the sun painting you golden as you crawl in the sand, as you walk, as you swim, as you stand ankle deep in the lake with your hands in your hair, elbows cocked and hip out and you pose. And red fills you to burst in your heart, in your veins, flow with hope as you ask to go out with the boy six years older, a man, and your snarl is red as your mother says no and you can't, and you flare and the window is open. Red heats down your breasts to your belly, lights your way to the bar and the red lit back alley. And you give what you have, who you are, what you think that he wants. And he is gone to a girl his own age, a woman. And red clots and scalds and you cry in your pillow and your mother who said no braids your hair. Mm. Purple stretches like puddles, the good grades, the class ring, the gossip in the hand of a boy with blue eyes who looks just at you and you dance the blue starlight and you foxtrot for glory, a diploma, a job, a wedding, a layoff, a baby, a baby, a fight, there's no money, a job, then a house with a yard and a dog and a cat an affair, his then yours, a divorce and a cancer, a song at a concert, an online romance, a marriage, a late baby who stops breathing. Your arms are so empty, but then Paris and Greece and soft Sunday mornings, hot coffee, cheese Danish, a grave with red roses, you say goodbye to your mother and blue slows to black, the black streaked with silver, the moon on your face, a grandchild's gilded laughter, a son's long embrace, a gold clock encased in crystal, and the night you sit by the ocean, the water a silk whisper, a warm blanket draped over your knees. Open, open wide, brilliance. Hmm, a lot of uh, light and color imagery in that. Uh, right. And obviously there's the inevitable, you know, noticing the, uh, sort of parental you know imagery as well you know like you know the parents are always very patient they see their kids go through a lot of crap and then they they know it's going to happen they've been there themselves probably you know right. so they're just they're looking back and they're like, you're, you're really you really don't want to do this do you and then they go and do it and then you know it's like you know they still sit back with you and they listen and they are parents you know that's what good parents are supposed to do you know be patient so that's a lovely poem, a lovely, excellent poem uh, with Thank a lot you. of great, great, powerful um, flow. And, you know, it makes me think of like, you know, a starlight flowing into a river, you know, in the way that the water just kind of flows out with the light, you know. Something, Perfect. Yeah, that may, that's what that I thought of, the, the general feeling of the, the way the symbolism and the light, you know, imagery was running. That made me think of that. So if you want to share mm -hmm. another one, feel free. Sure, let me quick find one here. Well, let's do Triumph because I also love cars. 
Okay. And and the first car I ever fell in love with was the TR7, which mm-hmm. had a TV commercial. It was it was the first car that had pop up headlights where you would hit a button and they would come popping out like eyeballs. And the mm-hmm. uh, the advertisements on TV showed the car driving into a prism shaped garage. And the, the catch line for the TR7 was the shape of things to come. Hmm. So this is Triumph. I am 15 and you are 20 when you take me for a ride in your new car, a TR7, the shape of things to come. You are my cousin and we used to play when I was four and you were nine, when I was seven and you were 12, but now you drive you own a car, the TR7. I've discovered cars, I've discovered boys, but I don't yet know what it means to be a girl in a car with a boy, the shape of things to come. Add sirens sing that sleek low car, pop up lights that slice the night, tight curves, the leaping speed, a garage shaped like a prism, the shape of things to come. That night in that car, I look at you, spill of black curls, new broad shoulders, your boyhood face behind a beard, a mustache. I watch you manhandle those gears, your hand like a fist. I strap myself in, try to restrain these new curves. I don't know how to restrain with your special order five point seatbelt. You mash the gas and those batting eye headlights split the dark with the light of day and the engine screams and so do we. Your arms flex straight and my ass is pressed into the leather seat and there we are, launched. Within the safety of a cousin, the net of memory playing with Hot Wheels cars in the driveway gravel, I become a girl in a car with a boy the shape of things to come. I rip off my seatbelt and whoop. Hmm, it's interesting. Again, you have the progression of time and the way you, you know, you flow into the, you know, towards the end where you start talking about the Hot Wheels cars and the shape of things to come. Interesting way of, of putting this in that situation, you know, that's, 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 you know, it's quite interesting how you, you use time and the flow of time into things. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, you know, I think you caught sort of a masculinity in that as well. The, the power of, you know, gripping the, the steering wheel and all that, you know, yeah. taking control mm-hmm. of the car and excellent, excellent poem. And thank you for sharing that. So another thing I'm interested and curious about is the All Writers Workplace and Workshop. What, uh, what, when did you start this and what uh, purpose did you hope to achieve with it? I started All Writers in 2005, so we're 16 years old now. And my whole purpose when I started it was I wanted there to be a place like I wanted when I was growing up to be a writer. I wanted it to be a safe place. I wanted there to be a mix of people who are just putting their first words down on paper with writers who have several books out so that we have a mix of energies and expertise and just offer to everything. That's why it's called All Writers. We welcome all genres. We welcome all abilities. We welcome anything. And it's it's become exactly that. It's become a community as well as an education source. Uh, we teach both online and on-site classes and workshops in all levels of creative writing. We do coaching. We do editing. You know, So we, we really reach out to the writer. And I also make it a point to keep my prices down so that pretty much anybody can join that we don't, we don't often hear from people who say I can't afford that. So we keep it, keep it available. We've become international. We are across the world. Um, I just had two more students last week get books accepted at traditional publishers. We're somewhere around 150 books accepted now. Uh, with our students. And we are in the middle, I think, of our fifth year of not going a single week without a student being accepted into a magazine or an anthology. Mm. So it's it's a big place. Yes, it is successful. And it's it's a big part of my heart. And it's a lot of work, too. I, I went into this not knowing how to run a business. I had 
I've never taken a business class in my life. And I thought all I had to do was get a place and open the doors and keep on teaching. And it's been a learning process to find out there's a lot more to running a business than that. Right, registering it and and getting the DBAs and the L. You, I know it's an LLC. It's an it? LLC. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we learned a little bit about that when I started it. Uh, my publishing company. I learned a little bit about some of those those little tricks. You know. <laughs> you know it then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Publicity. How do you get the word out? Yeah, all mm -hmm. of that. So. Right. That's yeah. the tricky part. It's always the tricky part. Right. So we, I think we have a, about a remaining five minutes or so uh, and I was going to ask him if you could maybe answer this do you think there's a, a shrinking of literary reading among the American public and do you think there's a way we can encourage more reading well I mean before the pandemic I would have answered yes to that that there was a shrinking going on one of the things that's being talked about as a result of the pandemic is reading exploded and I even read an article the other day that said the brick and mortar bookstores were one of the few businesses that didn't suffer all that much during the pandemic because people needed something to do. So they began to read. Um, I, don't, I don't know quite how I want to frame the word literary. I mean, I write the genre literary fiction, mm -hmm. but I just want people to read. You know, mm -hmm. and and my husband is a mystery writer. My daughter is writing horror. You know, I, I teach mm. romance writers. So as as long as people are reading, I'm happy. Right. And so I think right now there's there's an explosion in in reading, and so that mm -hmm. that makes me very happy. I would wish it hadn't taken a pandemic to get us to do it, but I think people just need more time, more time to you know be able to sit down with a book and having to work all the time and keep up with all the other stuff homemaking and whatever else is out there you know that you need to do I mean maybe people just need a little space and time where they can feel comfortable reading that's so, quite you know. possible you know and and they needed an escape too you yeah. know to get to get out of our everyday there for a while which was scary Hopefully we'll come out of this pandemic with a little better, much better attitude and a better, you know, scenario and as far as political and public life and, you know, social life. I hope that, you know, we, as you could say, face redemption from all this. So if you, you want to, you both know, hoping that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think we're all hoping that, you know, it's yeah. like, it's been a really tough couple of years, you know, just <laughs> it's unbelievable what, what we've seen, you know, it's, uh, you know, but anyway, uh, if you want to, we have a remaining couple of minutes, if you want to, um, you know, say thank you to anybody or, uh, you know, share some words with the audience that uh, encourage them to continue pursuing their artistic uh, endeavors, uh, then you have sure. time for that. Okay. Well, thank you to you, of course, for, for having me on. And, and thank you for Leia at Finishing Line Press, who connected me with you, which I thought was, was wonderful. Um, the, mm -hmm. the moment of advice, I guess, that I would give, and I give this to my students all the time, is to write the stupid. And what I mean <laughs> by that is when we sit down to write, sometimes we start and we say, oh, that's stupid. And we delete, 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 and then we start over again. Don't delete, stick with it for a while. Because sometimes the creative process just takes us in all sorts of amazing ways. You know, with any of my books, they all started to be one thing and then they went another. And so just write the stupid. Don't delete so fast. Don't edit so quickly that you, you talk yourself out of what might have been a really good idea. Excellent. I think that that's that is true. And I, I find that myself. I've been a writer for many years, and I feel that I, I you know, I run into that problem quite a bit. Where I, I feel like ah, that's not worth it. It's not worth it. You know, you, you tell yourself that a lot, and, and maybe maybe you should just continue. You know, right. just keep pushing it. And uh, that's excellent advice. And um, I'm glad that uh, you said that because a lot of writers, I think, need to hear. You know that that's very important to just. Do even when you think you're in a stuck in a hole and you've got you've got a story in there somewhere right just so, write anything absolutely so hopefully we'll uh you know keep seeing your books coming out and uh okay. and, and i'm really your stories are really amazing the things you've told us today it's 
excellent. You're wrestling with some some deep uh, problems and and uh, and you know cultural and social issues that in your work, and that's that's definitely a sign of a, a great mind. So I just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's wonderful talking to the people I you know speak with. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear what they've uh, accomplished in spite of all of these obstacles and and. You know, uh, there's so much going on and, and all the time with everybody and, and, you know, we never know what, you know, is going to happen. So we just, just keep plugging on and just keep doing what we do. That's right. So that's, I mean, I, I did not publish my first book until I was 50. You wow. know, I'd, I'd published short stories and too. poems everywhere, but a book eluded me until 50. So don't quit. Absolutely. So thank you again for joining us. Um, and, and, you know, we will hopefully we'll have our 1 million subscriber challenge. We're trying to attain 1 million subscribers to this channel. And uh, so everybody out there listening in, if you like what we are doing, please subscribe, tell other people about us. And we have an anthology coming up pretty soon, uh, which will be of our guests and, and some of our publishing that we've done. Uh, with New York Parrot, and we're looking for uh, just any, you know, we're looking for people that are, have interesting stories to tell us. It'll be in August, uh, so anybody can get in touch with us uh, to be a guest between then and now and then, and uh, we'll definitely uh, get that book going, and, uh, you know, we're looking for short stories, poetry, essays, everything, you know, so it'll be a nice anthology and, uh, and visual arts as well, uh, so uh, anyway, thank you again. And, uh, you know, we're looking for subscribers, as I said, one million subscribers. So let's get everybody out there mobilized. <laughs> and, and we have a donation uh, ability to donate that'll be on our YouTube. If anybody wants to look at that, uh, it'll be paypal.me slash NY Parrot. You can get in touch with me at literarycorner at newyorkparrot.com if you have any questions or want to be a guest on our program. So uh, please, please do that. Don't hesitate at all. We're looking for anybody, you know, you have something creative to say, some interesting stories to tell, please get in touch. Uh, support us and support our projects and we will support you as well. Thank you very much. This has been the New York Parrot Literary Corner with Kathy, Kathy Giorgio and you don't know where we'll be tomorrow. So keep in touch. Thank you and goodbye.